Sound of Money with Santosh Seru. Hello and welcome to another amazing episode of The Sound of Money, my podcast which has been appreciated by each and every one of you, be it through LinkedIn or Twitter or Facebook and of course YouTube. Thanks again for being all along to this amazing journey on The Sound of Money. Today on this show, I have another wonderful guest joining me from Delhi. Uh, he is the CEO and the founder of Rapid Pricer, and we'll get to know more about Rapid Pricer in a minute from now. And also he's the strategy advisor for Global Launch Space. Now, Rapid Pricer, uh, basically it helps retailers to increase uh, margins and reduce waste by automating pricing. It sounds really interesting and, and Kiran is all here to, say, to tell us all about that. And also in promotion in real time, unlike traditional consulting solutions. So that's what he runs uh, as Rapid Pricer. Uh, Kiran is also the global launch base. Uh, uh, he's also the uh, consultant to this international business company, which is an expansion consultancy firm, uh, basically focusing on helping international startups uh, launch their operations in the Indian market. And that's precisely the topic of our discussion today. So let's welcome Kiran Gange, who is joining me from Delhi. Hi, Kiran, and welcome to The Sound of Money. Thank you. Thank you so much, Santosh. A pleasure being here. And thanks for the kind words and the introduction. Uh, my pleasure, Kiran. Kiran, the first question I have for you is now that we are, you know, in the Amrit Kal or India is really heading into, do you see a lot of interest coming in from global uh, participation uh, and wanting to be in India? How, how has been the response? So everybody is curious, right? So when you talk about India, uh, their, their perception is uh, whether it is Mexico, I spend a lot of time there or Europe, hmm. everybody like you know, Kira and India is going to be the number one country, what's going on? And, and they still find it very different. Uh, mm -hmm. They are still not comfortable to jump into India, but they're very aware. And they, okay. they look at India with a lot of respect, uh, especially in places like the US, mm. um, where a lot of the people who go there are, are very hardworking and, and trying to make a big difference. So yeah. that, that, that perception is clearly changed over the number of years. They're very interested, but still hesitant to jump into India head first. So my question obviously is, what is that hesitation all about? Uh, is, it about is it about the business sense or is it about the culture issue? Where is the gap and what do you think could be done to bridge that gap? So one is uh, uh, not knowing exactly what uh, the Indian market will be like, right? So if you think about Mexico, Mexico in some ways is similar to Spain or mm. other parts of Europe. US is kind of similar to Europe. UK is similar to Netherlands, say, for example. Yeah. So they're all familiar with where to go about. Mm. And we, from Indian standpoint, we've watched Hollywood. We, we've seen uh, American companies. We are more familiar with their culture than yeah. they are with Indian culture. The yeah. perception they have about India is, is very limited. It's about news. Okay, Israel yeah. has just sent a mission to the moon. Fantastic. Yeah. But hey, I just saw... Bollywood movie, lots of dancing going on. Yeah, I don't know which one should I connect with. Yeah. So they kind of very much, uh, you know, I like this restaurant, but should I go in and try the food? Kind of a feeling there, you know. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. We'll very very interesting them. perspective you're bringing in, Kiran, because we always thought everyone wants to be coming into India, but there is always that kind of, uh, as you rightly put, uh, the hesitation. It's it may not be hesitation, but they don't know where to start. So. What are firms like you, consultants like you, uh, doing and trying to bring such kind of investments? How has been your experience talking to clients like these? Yeah, so so the uh, I, I, for me, just just to go back to my introduction a little bit, I grew up in India, and yeah. almost all of my work experience has been outside of India. Yeah, uh, I've been working in California mostly, and then the last few years in the Netherlands. So, but at all times, I've had a team in India. Mm -hmm. And I've spent at least a few months in India every year. Yeah. So I kind of connect with both sides of the story, mm -hmm. right? I know yeah. what it means to work in Europe. I know what it means to get work done in mm -hmm. India. So in the last year and a half, say, for example, I mm -hmm. coached more than 123 companies in mm -hmm. various sessions on how to get ready for the Indian market. What can you expect? Mm -hmm. One of the biggest revelations uh, is often they believe India is representative of one business culture, one country. 
Yeah. It's not, not the India. Case. It's like the collection of many different unique cultures, right? So that yeah. difference. And also, the realization that uh, even a small segment of the Indian market sometimes can be much larger than a European country. Yeah, agree. That realization, really, they don't have it yet. Mm. And, and then, then they think about, okay, I shouldn't look at India as one market. Yeah. Where is my opportunity? That, that gets them thinking about what needs to be done next. Okay, okay. Maybe you could share some amazing experiences, maybe good and not so good, probably, with your clients and who, who have brought been brought into India and, you know, there have been success stories or any challenges probably that they faced and you were able to kind of kind of take them through and, you know, things turn around later for them. Okay, so I'll give you an example of uh, one success story and it is kind of like a mixed success, I would say. Yeah. So they grew for three years in Eastern Europe mm. and had uh, there was like kind of like uh, companies which would hire uh, like a staffing company for, for European um, businesses, right? Uh -huh. so they were hiring from all over, and they grew a little bit, but they came to India. The numbers here were so huge. Hmm. They were able to make three times more than what they had done in three years okay. within a short period of time in India, right? So uh -huh. they were really happy with this, that they, there are so many people who are interested in what they have to offer as long as they identify the target market, right? Hmm. There is another company, which is an agri-tech company, hmm. and they were looking to reduce food waste in silos. Okay. You, know, you store agricultural grain and in India, up to 40, 50% of this grain goes wasted mm. in different stages. And if you see the internet, there's all kinds of articles about silos coming up in India. Yeah. And they're like, you know what? Such a big amount of wastage. There is a need in the market. I see silos. Let's go. And they come here. And after they come here, they realize the silos being installed in India are so new. Mm. They are more modern than the ones in Europe. Uh-huh. Uh, but 95% of the grains are still stored in what we call gunny bags. Yeah, exactly. The warehouses. And what kind of a sensors are you going to put inside those? Yeah. It wasn't evident until mm. they actually came to the ground, met the people, saw what the market looked like. Mm. So they had to pull back saying what it looks like is not what the reality of the situation is. Mm. Okay. So that kind okay. of uh, understanding does not come from the internet, right? You'll have literally have foot on the ground. Yeah. Real, if there is a market opportunity or not. Yeah, yeah. So, so let's come to the ease of business, which Indian government, uh, Indian, uh, you know, businesses, Indian, Indian industry federations have come all, uh, all the way to make an effort, a very consistent effort, and a, um, an amazing effort through missions abroad, consulates abroad, to bring those investments in India, India. And of course, they have come, and we do see an amazing FDI in India at this point in time, probably a record. But uh, on the ground, I'm sure you come across those challenges. Uh, what is it that that extra you know, effort that probably you feel should be done by or undertaken by Indian government or Indian agencies or Indian industry federations that could make that ease of business truly easy to deal with when it comes to foreigners investing or interested in investing? So one is ease of doing business is improving and it is good it is improving. Um, but it is for me, for an entrepreneur, for a startup, it's just like saying the door to a building is easy to open. Hmm. What hmm. happens in the building is the important next step. If you don't open yeah. the door, they will never come. So that yeah. needs to be fixed initially. Agreed. But uh, I've, I've had startups in three different countries and I've expanded to many countries myself, not just yeah. India. The yeah. biggest challenge we face, Santosh, as a startup and all of the companies who I work with is hmm. two things. Right? One is how can I launch? How can hmm. I get my first customer? And second is, how can I get the funding as a mm. startup, right? Mm. So it doesn't matter how many hands you shake, how many conferences you attend, which minister is coming to which event, which is all good to know there is support. Mm. Where really the rubber meets the road is when you can guarantee them a pilot. Mm. Okay, okay. Don't burn your fingers, okay? Mm. Let mm. us, you come to India and I will give you a project with this known customer under my protection. Mm. And you learn all your lessons mm. just now, okay? Just 20 minutes before our call. Mm -hmm. I was looking to help a, a company from Lithuania launch mm -hmm. here in India. Okay. Right? The first thing I'm going to do for them is I'm going to set up real customers with them without even them coming here mm. and collect the findings of those meetings yeah. before you think about what to do, where to open a bank account, what to do mm. next. That's all coming next. Yeah. But the 
first step mm. of actually landing, you know, feet first in yeah. India. Mm. I don't see any programs doing that. Mm. Can I give you a pilot to you on in this six weeks? Come to India and we will give you a pilot with a case study. And that case study, you can take it back to your investors. You can yeah. take it to your go-to-market strategy. Lots of things can be done in that one experiment. Yeah. Yeah, but we're skipping that. We're going straight to getting to like a partnership with the Larson and Tubros. Yeah, and then they burn the fingers a much larger Absolutely. scale at that point. Understand? Of time. Understand? So I, I, I was a uh, two discussions I had today just along these lines. Santosh mm -hmm. is how can we help companies get their pilot with mm -hmm. very little cost as mm -hmm. quickly as possible when they okay. come to it. Okay, uh, Kiran, you brought out a very important point here. Is that uh, as uh, you know, it's just like an any Indian guest walking into someone's home. You keep your you know you keep your footwear outside and then you step into the house, right? So, do you see these cultural differences that are happening? That's my first question. And two, uh, I think is also about the fact that uh, as you say, these case studies, you know, start off with pilot. Don't go into the big mode immediately. Get to know the market, understand the situation, right? Uh, the culture exactly, right? So my question to you is that, uh, is there something that is missing in this, which the government or agencies can do, you know, so that future customers, and, and again, at the fact that you have so many guys wanting to, are interested in India and want to come and step into India, set up businesses, but there is something that could be done further, you know, and since you know the India story as well, the India side of it with your experience here, and now that you know the other side of it with your interactions globally, uh, what is that extra, you know, that cream that probably the Indian government and the agencies or the industry uh, associations could do to make yeah. this whole entry a lot more seamless and a lot more comforting and cushioning? So there are absolutely big cultural differences, right? And they're all innocent cultural yeah. differences, which can make huge implications. Say, for yeah. example, if you invite somebody to a wedding in India, nobody mm. will say no. They yeah. say, of course, and then and, and you, you'll have to read the body language to see if they're going to come or not, right? Yeah. That misguides these European friends of mine so badly. Uh -huh. Like this guy said, he's going to work with me, but he's not responding to my emails. Hmm. That's a big difference in culture. Very, very good point. Everybody's yeah. trying to be nice to each other, but the yeah. business is not working. Yeah. Right? You go attend a meeting with a big group of government officials and or high-ranking officials. Yeah. What happens in the meeting? The interpretation does not require a PhD, but it mm. requires somebody who understands both sides of the culture. Yeah. What I would suggest is, you know, in one of in these programs, which mm. is the government conducts the accelerators. Yeah. There are many, many Indian students who are working abroad, living abroad. Yeah. Master's degree, right? Mm. If we can have them attend these meetings, they yeah. understand both sides of the culture. True. I do that. Okay. I do that yeah. many times. I attend these meetings and I tell them, hey. He's only trying to be nice or this is what his role is. Here's yeah. how you approach this business sales cycle. Yeah. That cultural difference in itself, it can be done through training hmm. to, to, to some aspect. I am conducting a workshop for uh, the Confederate of Indian Industries in November on uh -huh. how to do business outside of India. Fantastic. Yeah. Right? yeah. So, so either through this workshop or by having people who understand both sides of the story attend these meetings can help. Yeah. Yeah, that's, yeah, definitely. Bridge the gap, you know. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I can completely understand. You know, you are the sandwich here. Where you know you have to make sure your customers, or your your international clients, get exactly what you. And at the same time, luckily right. for you, you know the the back end there in India, and probably you try to bridge that gap. Uh, Kiran, my next question to you actually is on your other business, where you're the CEO and the founder of uh, Rapid Pricer. A very interesting strategy, and uh, in terms of pricing strategies that you work on. How did you get into this mode uh, and maybe a little bit and now let's delve into the, the Kiran Gange behind the CEO and the, you know, the founder. Uh, how did this whole start? I believe you, 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 you're from Bangalore otherwise originally, right? How, how has yeah. been your career journey if you could share? Yeah, so um, I will connect how these two also come to what we were talking about, uh, uh, Santosh. But yeah. I started off as an engineer. Uh, it's it's in Bangalore and everybody's either an engineer or nobody, I guess. So a lot of pressure from the family. You got to be an engineer, but I was more interested in, in being entrepreneurial, doing business. I like starting new things. So I went on to get my MBA in California. Okay. And then uh, I like marketing. I like mathematics also to some extent. So I got into pricing, pricing for retail. So that's okay. my first consulting job. I did that for a couple of years. And then the CEO of a, a retail firm hired me 
he was also okay. the president of uh, american institute of mathematics uh -huh. so he made me bring my engineering books back <laughs> why are we doing this strategy to explain to me for this equation right so that's how i started and i also started a company to support my full time job okay and since 2005 until now i've been through many different startups uh, all okay. of my yes so i love uh, doing pricing i had done that for about 16 years mm -hmm. this is consulting on strategy on how to yeah. use pricing to to increase your profitability but i always had a connection to conserving nature to mm. Western Ghats, that's that's uh, where my family is from, and I wanted to connect the two. Mm. So what I did in 2017 is I I took the IP from my old company and I mm -hmm. created a new product where we can reduce food waste through dynamic mm. pricing, so okay. make it more sustainable. Right? Mm. If a banana changes color, the price changes so that mm. people buy it before it goes bad. Yeah, and right now it's one of the top causes of global warming is yeah. food being wasted. Right, mm. fifty percent mm. of all bananas grown are never eaten. Mm. That is a stunning number. Yeah, right. So so now, I feel good. I was already enjoying my Monday morning, but I enjoy it even more. Yeah, because what I'm doing is is more in line with what I want my life to be associated. True. Right now, but this business. I can't keep doing this forever. What I want to be doing is I want to be helping companies accelerate in India mm. because the conservation situation in India is really not good. Yeah. I've watched the destruction right in front of my eyes in the Western mm. Ghats, and it yeah. really hurts me. Mm. I want to do something to stop it. And also agri-tech, right? The yeah. less land can be more productive. Mm. India mm. is the second largest producer of wheat. Yeah. And Netherlands produces 20 times more per hectare than India does. Mm. Imagine how much can be produced in India yeah. if we get scope and the immense potential. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. So, so yeah. the two areas of focus now I have is uh, food waste, agri tech, uh, okay. or conservation, right? So, yeah. so bringing companies from Europe and US to help these causes is why I I'm an advisor on a global launch base, and and that's where I wish to transition my career into from the world of pure pricing, fantastic, uh, towards fantastic. food and agri tech. Amazing. Uh, but I just wanted to know uh, from a rapid pricing strategy perspective, uh, you know, you included uh, Algo and uh, the rise of AI in that, as an industry, right? Uh, I'm sure you've seen that journey transit and now you have AI being talked about. How has been that experience and how is it that India can bring that kind of flavor to their businesses and, you know, uh, as you rightly put, reduce waste? Yeah, I think uh, what, what I'm doing is really um, is kind of the best practices in pricing, right? Yeah. So if, if you always price based on intuition, based on costs, what we yeah. bring is science and we change pricing based on demand. How yeah. much is a customer willing to pay for a green banana versus a brown yeah. banana? There is a lot of value we add there, right? Mm. So I've got, uh, basically what I've learned in consulting, the book I wrote, yeah. is about what I did in the past. But what I'm doing is how can you do it through machines hmm. instead of somebody having to do it using artificial yeah. intelligence. Uh, curiously, we don't work in India at all. We don't have mm -hmm. any clients in India. We have a lot of resources in India who work yeah. on it, but not clients, because the challenges in India are a little bit different. Mm -hmm. And India is not probably going to take that path of technology adoption like the West did. Hmm. They're going to bypass it, go okay. straight to e-commerce, go straight to the fulfillment of the consumers. Okay. So I don't see what I'm doing in Europe directly coming to India. There's okay. going to be innovation in a different space, hmm. which is uh, behind the transformation of retail in India. Okay, okay. Uh, Kiran, one last question before we leave. Uh, there's a lot of positive, optimistic, uh, very hopeful talk about India in its next 25 plus years, right? The Amrit Kal, as we talk. From your lens, how do you see that India and in terms of not just uh, growth, but, you know, uh, diversifying, uh, uh, you know, being an economic superpower, you know, where do you see? Because you have seen India now from both the sides. You've been in India, done there, been there, done that, and then you, you migrated and then, you know, you saw India from another lens. So what is it that you see for India in the coming years and where do you see India heading? So... You see the kids who are, who are who are growing up in India, it doesn't matter where they are, right? So it mm. could be like the remotest of village. They know how to create a Instagram reel. They know yeah. how to use AI to create a oh, yeah. video for you immediately. Yeah. Yeah. All of these are skill sets needed for tomorrow. 
Yeah, right. Absolutely. So India has this population blessing of mm. young, educated, talented individuals who are going to go and and become more successful. And so many of them have an altruistic intuition, uh, intention of making the yeah. country a better place, making the society a better place. Right. So, so what I don't want India to become is a uh, a place like a crowded uh, metropolis. Mm. You know. If you go to Amsterdam, I lived there for three years, right? Right in the middle of the city, you see huge green areas preserved yeah. for the society to operate within. Yeah. Hmm. So that's that's what I, I, I am a little bit worried about. You hmm. know, growth is definitely going to happen. The yeah. country is definitely going to become prosperous and efficient. I want all of us as people, you hmm. know, who are coaching companies, who are, who are students now to take into account Prosperity is not just money and economy. It is yeah. also preserving what we yeah. already have. Sustainability is important. Sustainability, yes. Yeah. But uh, I think there needs to be some conscious effort being done to push mm. that, to, to, to make sure everybody knows that needs to happen. But if it is done, if we can become like, you know, India is one of the few countries with the goals of reaching the climate goals right now. Yeah. So if we can do it a little bit more aggressively, yeah, it can be a beautiful place. Uh, in, in 20, 30 years. I'm really looking forward to it. Absolutely. Uh, I mean, I'm sure all of our listeners, our viewers are in a similar, you know, uh, thought process. They, do they look forward to a, an amazing uh, and a developed India in the coming years. Kiran Gange, Strategy Advisor, uh, Global Launch Space and CEO and Founder at Rapid Pricer. Thank you so much for being on this show on my podcast, The Sound of Money. Be a pleasure, Shantosh. Really enjoy the conversation. Thank you so much. And well, with that, we come to the end of this episode of The Sound of Money. Hope you guys enjoyed it as much as I've been enjoying having Kiran on my show. From me, Santosh Sirur and Kiran Gange, thanks again for being on The Sound of Money. Bye-bye. Sound of Money with Santosh Sirur.